18-year-old Jane Eyre is about to start a new phase of her life as the governess at Thornfield Hall. Lowood School served Jane well for the last eight years, but it's time for a change. We rejoin her in the final stages of her 16-hour journey to Thornfield. There's plenty of excitement, but also some doubt. Will Mrs Fairfax, who seems to be the owner of Thornfield, be a decent person? Or will she be another Mrs Reed? Finally, the carriage stops in front of a long, dark mansion. This is it. A maidservant comes out to greet Jane and ushers her inside. They pass through a huge entrance hall, then into a smaller, much cosier room. There, by the fire, is Mrs Fairfax. Gosh, what a relief. Sitting there with her cat and her knitting, Mrs Fairfax is a picture of sweetness. Jane was expecting the old lady to be grander, but is grateful for the warm, motherly welcome. Mrs Fairfax is also glad that Jane has come. It means she has someone to talk to, someone of equal standing, that is. Thornfield Hall can be a lonely old place, and she prefers to keep the servants at a polite distance. Jane wonders what the connection is between Mrs Fairfax and Miss Varans, Jane's young pupil. It's odd, because the girl and her nanny only arrived at Thornfield a few months ago. But it's midnight, and Jane is tired, so she doesn't ask. No doubt all will be revealed in time. Mrs Fairfax shows Jane upstairs to her bedroom, which is so lovely that Jane offers a private prayer of thanks. After that, she's out like a light. The next morning, Jane rises early, dresses neatly and heads downstairs. As she passes through the entrance hall, she's struck by the grandeur of the place. This will take some getting used to. She then steps outside to get a good look at the house. It's pretty, but also imposing. No wonder Mrs Fairfax gets lonely. And it turns out that she's not the owner. Mr Edward Rochester is the owner, but he's hardly ever here. Mrs Fairfax explains that she's distantly related to Mr Rochester, but really, she's just the housekeeper. The other thing is that Miss Adele Varans is Mr Rochester's ward. But why he's decided to be the girl's guardian is unclear. Maybe he's just a nice guy? When Adele comes bounding over the lawn to meet them, Jane realises that both she and her nanny Sophie are French. Luckily, Jane speaks fluent French and, at breakfast, Adele opens up. Mr Rochester brought her to England after the death of her mother, who'd been a popular lady. She'd taught Adele how to dance and sing, which she displays in an impromptu performance. After breakfast, Jane and Adele have their first lesson in the library. Adele is a pleasant student but struggles to concentrate. Since it's only her first lesson, they stop at midday. Now that she had a free afternoon, Jane joins Mrs Fairfax. She's tidying a particularly beautiful part of the house, a richly furnished dining room and private drawing room or living room. Everything sparkles. Since Mr Rochester's visits are usually quite sudden, Mrs Fairfax likes to keep the rooms in constant readiness. Jane tries to get the lowdown on Mr Rochester. Is he fussy? Is he likeable? But Mrs Fairfax's answers are vague. It's hard to read his moods, but he's a good master. That is all. Jane wishes she would elaborate, but doesn't push it. Mrs Fairfax then takes Jane on a tour of the mansion. They venture into the gloomy third storey, through the narrow passageways and all the way up to the rooftop battlements. What a view! But as they come back down, Jane hears something <laughs> disturbing. A low, ghostly laugh. <gasps> there it is again. <laughs> but apparently, it's just the servants. And Miss Fairfax tells Grace Poole off for being noisy. Months pass. 
and Jane continues to enjoy her time at Thornfield. Adele is a good pupil, though not especially talented, and Mrs Fairfax is consistently pleasant. In fact, Jane's life is now so comfortable that she feels restless. She often goes up onto the battlements to contemplate the horizon and imagine what lies beyond. Jane yearns to see the world, but regrets that she probably won't. It's not proper for women to be adventurous. During these meditations, Jane often hears Grace Poole's unsettling laughter. One day in January, Mrs Fairfax convinces Jane to let Adele have the afternoon off. To pass the time, Jane takes a brisk walk to Hay, the nearest village, to post a letter. By late afternoon, the light has grown dim and the country laneways are lonely. But Jane enjoys the stillness and sits a while to soak up the tranquility. But the ambience is disturbed by the sound of a horse approaching. The lane is too narrow and winding to see, so Jane sits and waits for the horse to pass. Under the pale light of the rising moon, Jane imagines the horse is a spirit from one of Bessie's legends. Then, a huge black and white dog glides past, giving Jane a little spook. Could these laneways be haunted? But when the horse passes, the spell is broken. It's just an ordinary man on a horse. Jane continues on her way but stops when she hears the horse slip on the icy path. Both horse and rider go down, and the dog comes racing back, panicking for his master. With a great deal of struggling and foul language, the man and his horse get upright again. But it's clear the traveller has injured his leg. Jane offers to help him, but he declines, even though he can't even stand up. He's a stern-looking guy, not particularly handsome, but Jane's not afraid of him. In fact, she defies him by staying put until he proves he can mount his horse. This gets his attention and he asks Jane where she's from. When he learns that she's governess at Thornfield Hall, he responds in a strange way. And is he analysing her appearance? Eventually, Jane helps the traveller to his horse, and they part ways. It was an unromantic encounter, but the man's face lingers in Jane's mind as she walks to Hay and back again. When she re-enters Thornfield, the place is lit up and cheerful voices echo from the dining room. Do we have visitors? Jane hurries to Mrs Fairfax's room, but the only one there is the giant dog she'd met in the laneway, sitting by the fire as if he owns the place. Jane repeats the name she'd heard the traveller use, Pilot, and the dog comes to her. OK, what's going on? Leah, the maidservant, explains that Pilot is Mr Rochester's dog. He's just arrived and is downstairs waiting for a doctor. His horse slipped in the laneway and he sprained his ankle in the fall. Ah, so that was Mr Rochester. The following day, Jane notices how Thornfield is changed by Mr Rochester's presence. Visitors come and go, and Jane enjoys the lively change of atmosphere. That evening, Jane is formally invited to take tea with Mr Rochester in his drawing room. For this occasion, Mrs Fairfax insists that Jane dress up a bit. A little extra formality is required now that the master is at home. But when Jane enters and Mrs Fairfax introduces her, Mr Rochester barely acknowledges them. He keeps his eyes on Adele and Pilot by the fire, and his responses are short. This isn't a problem for Jane, though. She's used to stern characters. Remember Miss Scatcherd? In fact, it would have been more awkward if Mr Rochester was cheerful and polite. When he begins to ask Jane questions, his manner is direct, almost angry but Jane keeps her cool and answers him honestly. She doesn't shy away from his piercing eyes and impatient tone. 
The thing is, he also pays her compliments. He's pleased with Adele's progress and impressed by Jane's tenacity for surviving eight years at Lowood. He then turns his attention to Jane's appearance, remarking on her otherworldliness. He thought she might have been a fairy when he saw her in the laneway the previous night. When he commands Jane to play a tune on the piano, he checks his tone and excuses himself. He's used to giving orders and being obeyed. It's a habit. Jane does as he asks, but he's not blown away by her musical talent. However, he's very interested in her sketches and paintings. In fact, he interrogates Jane to find out if someone helped her with them, but she assures him that they're all her own original work. He then closely examines three of her watercolours. They stir something in him to the point where he becomes annoyed and asks everyone to leave. Abrupt much? As they enter Mrs Fairfax's room, Jane gives her opinion about Mr Rochester's nasty moods. Mrs Fairfax is used to it, though. It's just his way. He also deeply resents something his family did to him a long time ago, some kind of unjust arrangement. While it secured Mr Rochester's wealth, it's also caused him years of heartache and made him hate Thornfield. After this vague explanation, Mrs Fairfax drops the subject. Over the next week or so, Jane observes how Mr Rochester's moods fluctuate. It obviously has nothing to do with her, so she minds her business. One evening, after dinner, Mr Rochester summons Jane and Adele into the dining room. A box has arrived containing several gifts for Adele, and he calls on Mrs Fairfax to occupy her while she unwraps them. Meanwhile, Mr Rochester draws Jane into conversation. He's in a good mood tonight. His eyes sparkle. Or is that just the wine? When he catches Jane staring at him, he asks her if she finds him handsome. Without thinking, Jane says no, then struggles to backtrack. Yikes. But this only spurs Mr Rochester on. He teases Jane for her brutal honesty, but appreciates her bold intelligence. Sensing that she's also a good listener, he starts to open up. He's in his mid-thirties now, but when he was 21, fate dealt him a cruel blow. It's not in his nature to be a villain, but his circumstances bring out the worst in him. Sadly, he doesn't believe it's worth the effort to change, but Jane challenges this. The conversation becomes murky after this. Mr Rochester displays a warped sense of right and wrong and starts to speak in riddles. Jane is puzzled but maintains a firm moral stance. Eventually, though, she gives up. He's talking nonsense and it's past Adele's bedtime. But he tells her to wait. Adele is about to re-enter the room to show off her new pink dress. And right on cue, Adele sachets in, looking like a charming miniature version of Celine Varans, her mother. This prompts Mr Rochester to partly explain his guardianship of Adele. She sprung from the naivety of his youth, and now he's raising her to atone for his sins. It's a vague justification, but that's all he's willing to offer right now. Why can't people speak the truth around here? Are Mr Rochester's secrets that outrageous? We hope you enjoyed this Schooling Online production. For more easy lessons, check out our other videos.